Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Art Break at Home with the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. My name is Jessica, um, and I am going to introduce your Art Break speakers to you today. And I'm also going to just introduce a little bit of news from the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Um, so we just opened a new exhibition called Africa Imagined Reflections of Modern and Contemporary Art. Um, and we would love to have you join us at the KIA to see this exhibition. It um, is mainly from the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts permanent collection with a few loans. And we are doing a virtual opening for this exhibition on Friday, I believe at 2 p.m. with our chief curator, Rahima Barber. Um, and that will be on this same platform. So you can join us from YouTube and from Facebook. It's a virtual exhibition or it's a virtual opening. Um, and the KIA is open uh, Wednesday through Sunday at varying times. Masks are required at the KIA for the moment. Um, and we do ask that you wear a KN95 or a surgical mask. Um, you can book website or you can book tickets on our website and you can also get our opening hours on our website because um, it varies a little bit day by day. So just launching straight into our program today. Today we are being joined by Rufus Ferguson and Elizabeth Start, and we will learn more about the Resonance Project, which was commissioned by the Connecting Chords Festival. The Resonance Project is a collaboration between the Connecting Chords Music Festival and the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts, which paired local musicians with works of art in the permanent collection exhibition, Unveiling American Genius, which is on display downstairs at the KIA. So, First, we will hear from Elizabeth, who will tell us a bit more about the Resonance Project and the Connecting Chords Festival. Elizabeth Start is the Executive Director of the Connecting Chords Music Festival, a cellist, a composer, and arts administrator. So first, I would like to introduce uh, Elizabeth, and then after her portion, I will introduce our main speaker, Rufus Ferguson. Oh, Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. hello, thank you. It's nice to, nice to be here. Um, and I'll try and get out of the sunlight. Um, I this project is something that we're really very proud of. It's something that we probably wouldn't have thought of if it weren't for the pandemic. And this really goes back to June in uh, uh, 2020 when we realized uh, finally that we couldn't do what we usually do, which is basically present concerts. Um, so we started asking ourselves, well, what can we do? And the idea of commissioning area musicians to create works, uh, musical works that went with um, artworks at the KIA just uh, came to us as a great idea. Um, and another thing that was really wonderful about it is we knew that we had people in the community who were suffering from having lack of work as, as musicians. So we wanted to uh, help get some money out to those folks as well. So we uh, commissioned uh, eight musicians to do this project and uh, Rufus was one of them, of course. and. Uh, everyone did two music, uh, two musical works responding to two artworks in the Unveiling American Genius uh, exhibit. And we worked fairly closely with Rahima uh, Barber, the uh, curator, as well as other staff like Jessica, to make sure that this would work where you, you can go into the exhibit, you can get a QR code and listen to the music right there with the artwork in place. You can also visit our website and actually see all of these pieces. Um, and I promise my comments would be uh, short, but I do encourage you to go to the CC Music Fest, um, CC Music Fest website and uh, see our other pieces, listen to our other pieces. We also have another uh, similar event, um, which is Music in Place, where we commissioned musicians to write about certain uh, places in Kalamazoo that are important to them. Um, this is something that uh, we're just very proud how well it worked out and actually Kerisa is using it as part of their curriculum this year for um, education for the arts so we're really proud about that too and um, I think that's all I have to say and please enjoy Rufus's presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so our main speaker for the day is Rufus Ferguson. Um, Rufus Ferguson is a multi-instrumentalist and educator 
who earned degrees from Western Michigan University under the mentorship of Jeremy Siskind and Matthew Fries in jazz piano. In his professional career, Rufus actively shares the stage with award-nominated and winning artists such as Dwight Adams, Robert Hurst, Rodney Whitaker, Allie Jackson, The Temptations, Ernest Pugh, David Wilford, and many more. Rufus has served as class piano instructor at Western Michigan University, where he also directed the University Jazz Lab Band and was also education manager for the Kalamazoo Symphony Orchestra. He is currently assistant professor of jazz and popular music at Albion College and jazz vocal accompaniment, accompany, accompanist at Kalamazoo College. Um, we're going to do something a little different today um, because Rufus created these two um, musical compositions to go with works of art in Unveiling American Genius. We want to make sure that everyone gets to see and hear his work, um, as well as with the artwork from the permanent collection at the KIA. So first we're going to start with listening to one of these works of music while also seeing the work. Um, so please, just for a couple of minutes, enjoy this beautiful composition, and then we will bring Rufus on, and then later I will play the other piece as well. Um, and that work of art is American Woman Columbia by Tylon Sawyer. And now I'm going to bring Rufus Ferguson into our screen. Welcome, Rufus. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jessica, for having me. Thank you, Betsy, Connecting Chords and the KIA uh, for affording me this opportunity to speak on these amazing artwork pieces as well as the musical responses that I have put to them. So thanks so much. All right, and um, I will mention that we will take questions in the comments of whichever uh, platform you are on. And um, I believe Rufus mentioned that he would like questions. Well, he will ask for questions, not necessarily at the end. So I will uh, remove myself for the moment. And thank you so much um, for joining us. So that first piece uh, entitled American Woman Columbia, and I'm going to just read. Um, my uh, musical notes response that I have given to this. American Woman Columbia instantly brings a level of pride, pain, and fear to my awareness of being a Black person in America. The music composed for this particular piece utilizes a toggle between minor and major tonalities that personifies the Black experience in America. The end of the piece has a repeating motive over an array of moving and evolving chord types and qualities. 
This moment stands as an example of the never changing injustice inside of an ever changing and evolving America. <clears throat> and so I'm just gonna kind of discuss a little bit of my process um, when writing these types of pieces. This was a very interesting piece. You usually as musicians don't have the opportunity um, to write things uh, of this nature. Um, not all, not necessarily because we don't want to, but a lot of times uh, it is not as um, uh, prevalent for musicians to be able to be paired with this type of work. With that said, um, instantly when I saw this piece, I immediately knew what that made me feel like. Uh, and weirdly enough, I could not explain it, but I knew what it felt like. Um, and so I began to go to the piano and I began to kind of create different uh, harmonic schemes. Uh, and then a melody came to me. And it was after the melody came to me that I could finally put um, a, a, an emotion that I could um, explain uh, to this uh, piece. And so as you hear the different things that's happening in, the, in this piece, you hear a lot of the, again, you'll hear the toggle between the minor, minor and the major tonalities. Um, this piece, and the, and the way I've composed the music um, shows a certain level of um, pride, pain, and fear. Um, and as many know, many may not know, uh, being Black in America has multi multiple different um, uh, emotions. There's different moments that happen, and obviously everyone goes through different moments. But a lot of the things that happen um, to Black individuals in America are, are um, pushed onto them by other societies, other cultures, other systems. Uh, and so there's oftentimes of highs and of lows, of, 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 of pride, of um, discouragement, of fear, of happiness, of pain, and trying to embody that, all of these things that I feel in one piece was a challenge. Um, the, the, the plus side of this was being a black person in America and especially a black man in America, I have felt them all. And so feeling them were not a problem. Um, bringing those feelings back to my memory, although not, uh, necessarily, uh, in a place where I wanted to do that, that was also not a problem, but being able to condense all of that into one, um, two, two and a half minute piece, um, even if it was a nine minute piece, was a challenge for me. And so I kind of had to pick, what are some of the biggest moments? And obviously everyone, uh, every person, every black person has different moments. And so I could really only um, compose this music based off of my story. Uh, and while it does to an extent represent uh, the, the larger population of Black America, as we all feel many of the same things, uh, there are a lot of um, micro feelings that happen on an individual level that I had to bring to this piece to make it make its character reflect more of me, um, along with um, trying to be some form of a representation for Black culture and the Black existence. And so that's why in my program notes, I chose um, to describe it as pride, pain, uh, fear, and awareness. Um, and so there are different moments musically that are happening where um, you'll hear the pride. You'll hear me go to a major tonality. You'll hear the pain. Um, you'll hear the fear. Uh, and I also feel like the major tonality kind of brings it along the awareness as well um, of, of my Black state in America. With that said, um, as I said, the end of the piece has a repeating motive. And I thought, and as I, after I wrote this program that I thought, well, that was interesting. Um, but the end of the piece has a repeating motive uh, over a moving chord progression. And I describe that as a moment that stands as an example of never changing injustice uh, inside of an ever changing and evolving America. Uh, we often see different things that come up, uh, you, you see on the news about different social justice movements and uh, 
different awareness that each uh, each movement is trying to bring uh, to the forefront so that change can be made. Uh, and although sometimes it's presented differently, uh, the core of what is being said, the core of the need and want for change um, often has been the same from its inception, uh, post-slavery, um, when Black individuals were granted the opportunity to an extent to um, live free, uh, their freedom obviously was not fully granted. And so as time progressed, time went on, uh, there were different social justice movements that kind of popped up to advocate and um, ask for specific types of freedom, specific rights um, to be granted uh, to the Black American. And so we often see some of those same things from, you know, again, post-slavery, late 1800s, uh, up until now, some of the same um, injustices are being uh, fought and are, are be trying to be brought to awareness uh, of America to the front door of the American steps. Um, but you often have seen as well, uh, America has changed and it has evolved. And there's a lot of things that have happened that have changed and become different and become new. Uh, and so we see the world growing and evolving, uh, but we see that certain things and certain injustices have yet to change. And so uh, that, that moment in that piece at the very end uh, just shows that moment where um, there is a repeating motive and it seems to not evolve. It seems to not grow. It just seems to kind of be the same over and over. Uh, but meanwhile, the harmony is growing and it's evolving and it's expanding. Um, and so that's just kind of the way that we're, we're moving with this type of, um, with this piece specifically. Uh, and obviously I wrote two pieces, but because both of them are just so deep um, and have such in-depth conversations and, and explanations to them, uh, I'm going to choose to have a Q and A kind of after each piece. Um, and so we can kind of get into some specific topics. Uh, if anyone has specific questions about um, this first piece, American Woman Columbia, please feel free to um, shout them out in the comments and I will do my very best um, to address the questions. Even if you just have a comment, I want to do my best to address the comment as well. Um, so we can move to the Q&A. So if anyone has anything, drop them in the comments below um, and I'm going to do my best to address them. Um, someone has said it would be good to hear the music again after hearing the composer's explanation. Uh, what do you think about that idea, Rufus? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Can, can we, this is Bill, can we take a few more questions? Cause I'm pretty sure people will, will want me to explain some things. And then at the end, I'm totally on board for us. Um, kind of listening to, to the piece again. Sounds great. And then how long did you think about the work before starting to put notes on paper? Uh, well, this work specifically not as long. Uh, again, you know, as I was saying earlier, when I saw this piece, I immediately felt what I felt. I could not articulate it musically uh, or orally at the point, but I know what I felt. When I saw this piece, I know what it felt like. Um, and so it was easy for me to identify my feelings. It took a little long longer to articulate my feelings. Um, so I would say maybe, um, maybe a day or two, I kind of sat with it. You know, I, I slept, you know, slept on it, woke up and kind of still thought about it. Um, typically when it comes to putting uh, music to art. I have a little experience. I have a, I actually have a, a brother who is an artist, a ph phenomenal artist for, for many of uh, America's top people, for Oprah Winfrey and for the former president, George Bush. And so I have lots of experience of putting music to artwork. Um, but uh, this piece specifically, just because it had um, a little deeper narrative to it, 
it took me a little minute. It took me a, a day or two to really kind of articulate what I felt and being able to somewhat put music to those feelings and then to be able to orally articulate that as well. Thank you. When composing this piece, did you start with the structural elements that you've discussed or by improvising based on your emotional response to the painting? Hmm. Um, I think, I think it was a little bit of both. I think because I'm a natural jazz pianist, uh, Improvising is kind of embedded in everything I do, even structurally creating things. Um, it's just part of the, the the musical palette that I choose from. Uh, with that said, um, I was also very intentional about kind of how each section of my piece um, would be structured. And so while maybe each each section may not have had a structure, I was very intentional about the sections uh, coming together in terms of which structure comes first and which emotion would come first and which uh, musical motive would be happening and when. I didn't know exactly what it would be, but I just knew the order in which I wanted to be presented, if that makes sense. And there are some other um, comments that are coming in about okay. how listening to your um, your composition made the listener feel. Um, but we know that it can take some time to type a question, so um, we'll we'll give it a few more moments for people to type any questions you might have about this piece. And and uh, Jessica, maybe if we can play the piece now, and if anybody want to drop any extra questions about this specific piece in the, in the chat. Uh, now's the time and we can kind of use this moment to take a listen. Sounds good. Um, we got another question um, for our EFA program, um, Education for the Arts. We will use this piece with children. 
Do you have any advice about how they can interact with art and music together? Um, yes. Um, one of the, with, well, specifically with my daughter, when we I uh, tried to expose her to both art and music. Uh, and one thing that I found that she does really well, and it's obviously every, every, ch every child is different, um, but listening to music and dealing with maybe just colors um, or shapes. Uh, I, I've noticed that she seems to find certain colors uh, warm when she hears certain things. And I don't think she necessarily understands the musical um, warmness, uh, more like more like color. She she'll see red or orange, and she finds them warm. And there's some things a little cooler. Um, but it's it's weird because when she, the color she chooses usually is the uh, colors that I musically choose. Uh, and so I I find that she understands to a degree a certain level of feeling uh, when she is correlating uh, the the warmth of colors that she cho chooses uh, or the coolness of colors. And she, it's not necessarily about specific colors, um, but there's certain things that triggers her in her ear that forces her to go for certain colors. And they're usually always aligned with what I'm thinking about. And I don't know if that's just because she's my daughter, uh, but um, this is something that I, I find that, you know, children kind of, do well with when listening to music, just kind of dealing with specific color palettes, uh, even before drawing or, or creating something, just kind of dealing with the color. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question is, when creating this piece, were you thinking in notes and dreams from personal experiences? Sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused about the question it says, uh, when creating this piece, were you thinking in note and dreams? Um, is it Taiki? Could you possibly explain that a little bit to me about in, in note and dreams? Um, I'll do my best to answer some of this. Um, when I when I was creating this piece, it, it wasn't necessarily about dreams for me. I don't, and I don't know if that's what you mean by dreams. But a lot of it, yes, did come from musical notes. Okay, cool. Uh, it, it wasn't, it, some of it came from personal experience. Um, but I'm glad you asked that because a lot of it did not come from personal experience. Um, while I did experience everything that I, I wrote about, um, when I instantly saw this, I saw obviously a black woman um, there. And that instantly triggered something for me because the black women uh, experience is much different from the experience of a black man. And so um, the fear that they feel is not the fear that we feel. The pain that they feel is not the pain that we feel. And so the music that I wrote um, is a lot more um, geared towards the feeling or at least understanding, acknowledging the feelings, the fear, the pain, uh, the discouragement and all of those things from the black woman's experience, um, which is something that I've done very often, um, even uh, for some who may have seen my Gilmore concert two years ago, uh, that was another theme of mine was dealing with uh, the experience of a black woman. I don't write as much about the black man, um, although the, the, the experiences are similar, uh, but because of my privilege, there are some things I do not understand. There are some things that I do not, um, I will not experience. Uh, and so I do my best to understand their experience uh, through this medium. Any more comments, questions? If not, um, I was just going to say, um, somebody had said it would be good to hear the artist statement about the work if it exists. I believe, um, I'm not positive, but I believe that the label for this work, which is on display downstairs at the KIA, does say what the artist 
um, was thinking about or the uh, inspiration behind this work. So I invite the speaker if, or the, the commenter, um, if they're in the Kalamazoo area to come in and um, see the work in person. And also you can use your uh, smart device to um, scan the QR code and you can also listen to the music in front of the work in the building. Yeah, um, and I I also have an artist statement that I wrote, um, and I, I'll read that to you briefly. Um, American woman Columbia instantly brings a level of pride, pain, and fear to my awareness of being a black person in America. Uh, the music composed for this particular piece utilizes a toggle between ma minor and major tonalities that personifies the black experience in America. Uh, the end of the piece has a repeating motive over an array of moving and evolving chord types and quality. And this movement, this moment, excuse me, stands as an example of the never changing injustice inside of an ever changing and evolving America. Um, and so the, the interesting thing about obviously about music uh, and art is uh, a lot of times it can be interpreted multiple ways. And oftentimes it is not interpreted the way uh, that the artist, uh, whether visual or musical intended. Um, but that's okay, kind of, you know, in this art form that we're dealing with. Uh, and so I don't know the exact um, interpretation I have read there, uh, artist statement, uh, but I kind of let the piece take on a new life for me uh, while doing my best to kind of stay true to um, the intention, at least the heart behind the piece. So if that's all for that piece, let's take a listen to the next piece, uh, if that's okay, Jessica, and then we'll, we'll dive into that one as well, Make, leave time for questions as well. So that uh, piece is by Matthias Alton. Uh, it's entitled Husking Corn at Dusk. Um, and I'm going to read my artist statement to you. Um, As having roots in the South, I have much experiencing individuals working in the field, which is what they call it, uh, where they would husk corn, pick various vegetables, work with horses, and much more. The music I compose for the specific artwork highlights different Southern musical traditions, such as bluegrass, gospel, and the blues. Uh, this piece really, really utilizes musical characteristics from what many field workers called field songs. These songs embody simple melodies and harmonies. And over time, these melodies are put over more complicated harmonic structures, 
uh, and eventually became gospel, jazz, and other American musical art forms. Uh, this musical response shows a simplistic melody over a developed harmonic scheme. And so, um, this piece is, uh, has a different emotion for me. Um, many people, a lot of times uh, in the Black community, when we think about our roots or heritage, um, the idea of working in the fields um, sometimes bring up e emotions or feelings of shame or embarrassment uh, just because of the conditions we were subject to be a part of or live in. Um, and so a lot of times when we moved out of the slavery um, era, a lot of Black Americans, Americans in the South were still doing uh, very similar tasks to what they were doing in slavery dealing with field work. Uh, however, I come from a family who is very, very proud of their Southern tradition of owning farms. Um, and obviously owning farms is itself is very, um, has, has a level of pride that should be appreciated. Um, but even before they owned farms and farmland, um, they are very proud of the Southern heritage that which they come from. Uh, which in turn makes me very proud of the heritage they come from, where uh, the everyday life is what you see in that picture. Uh, individuals in the fields with animals, with vegetables, with uh, different fruits and on, on the farm, um, wearing traditional, uh, I don't want to say sharecropper attire, but um, field working attire, I'll, I'll say. Um, even my grandmother, who is, I believe, 93 now, uh, owns a farm and uh, even now still goes to the farm to uh, work with her horses and her goats and cows. And she deals with the farmland and all of my uncles and most of my cousins um, all do this regularly. Um, I'm actually one of the few of my family members who have not um, went down that path. Uh, although I am very jealous because it always looks so fun and I always want to be a part of it. Uh, but because my my parents actually left the South uh, and moved obviously here to Michigan, uh, we didn't have that opportunity of, of, of having farmland. Um, but I wanted my music to reflect the pride in this um, lifestyle. Uh, and there is shame for some, I'm sure. Uh, but this was very, very personal for me. And so for this one, the, this piece uh, was a, a moment of uh, homage and pride about my family uh, and the Southern life that we live, where we deal with animals and um, uh, vegetables and we have farmland and uh, we tend or till the fields, as they say down South. Uh, and so this music was to reflect uh, that. Uh, and obviously the Southern tradition comes with more than just uh, farmland. There are specific musical traditions that come out of the South, uh, things like jazz, which comes out of New Orleans. Um, and gospel, uh, while it has, you know, traditionally has its formal roots in the mid, uh, Midwest, ch Chicago and Detroit, uh, it comes from, um, the history of it, of it obviously comes from uh, Southern music, such as field songs and spirituals, which come out of Southern um, states that nature. And so um, I wanted to put those musical elements in this music, um, again, as a form of pride, not only just of the Southern lifestyle, uh, but of the Black American musical tradition, uh, which uh, obviously jazz is probably one of the biggest ones and the most notable ones, but also gospel music, which uh, also is a very big contributor to the music industry and to the music uh, genre of, of present day and comes proudly out of the Black tradition and the musical tradition of uh, Black America. And so that's kind of the uh, story in, in, in a nutshell behind this specific piece. So if anyone has any questions uh, about any comments, uh, again, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will, I will do my best to address and answer them all. Um. Somebody has said that the color yellow in the corn and in the sunlight, um, I'm guessing of the painting, but maybe in real life, um, inspires that person, inspires hope for that person. 
Um, and do you also feel that inspiration of hope? I mean, yes, of course. Uh, you know, those bright, warm ye colors um, like yellow, I mean, even, even orange, um, orange to an extent as well, uh, they definitely bring a certain level of inspiration to me. Um, and especially when it's, you know, if, if you've ever been uh, in the South, and I know one of the great moments for me is when I'm able to go down South with my family and I go to the farm with my, her, our family farm with my grandmother and the sun is shining and all the beautiful vegetables, even the green ones and the yellow corn uh, are, are on the ground and the sun is just shining. It is, it is very inspirational. It's very hopeful. Um, and so, yes, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and while we're waiting for our audience members to type any questions or comments in the chat, um, I'm from the South as well. And that piece um, really reminds me of like taking a walk down like a sunny country lane. Yeah. Um, got a really nice kind of nostalgic feel for me <laughs> personally. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, that, that piece, um, again, a lot of these pieces take on many different connotations and interpretations, but um, yes, that when I think about that piece, that's usually the pace that I walk when I'm a lot of times, but that's usually the pace that I walk, especially down uh, south and my, my family owns basically the whole street of homes uh, in one of the cities that they live in. And so, you know, it's very often to wake up on one end of the street and you go outside and you see the sun shining and you kind of walk at the pace of that music and you see the farm and you see different horses and you're walking, you know, barefoot down the, down the road and it's warm. Uh, all these things are, are just kind of the, the, the beauty of living, um, as my family say, living in the country, you know, as a city boy, I didn't have that luxury. Uh, but down, down South, when you live in the country, you really have those moments to appreciate nature um, and the things that are around you. Anyone has any questions, comments, please drop them in the chat. I would love to respond to them. And do you want to listen to that piece a uh, second time as well? Yeah, we can listen to it one more time. So if anyone has any more questions, feel free. So would you like me to play that while um, we're waiting for audience members to type a question in? Yeah, that'd be great. Again, that is my piece, 
uh, as in response to the Matthias Alton piece, Husky Corn at Dusk. Any questions or comments? Again, feel free to drop them in the chat. I will address and answer all of them. Someone has asked, um, does the repetition in the music mimic the repetition of the chore? Uh, yes, actually it does. Uh, not necessarily, maybe not necessarily the chore. Well, I guess, yes, it could be the chore, but um, yes, when I saw this piece, that was the first thing that came to mind uh, was that um, repetition of that one note. Um, and it is to kind of uh, stand as a, as a moment of someone um, as what we call hoeing or tilling the field where the hoe is just kind of going up and down over and over and over. Uh, so yes, that actually, um, that moment in the very beginning is a direct representation of, of that motion, which is, you know, that, that chore, yeah. Um. Well, Rufus, I have a question, and it might seem um, I'm not a I'm not a very musical person. Um, so I've always kind of wondered, you know, how how a musician can even compose a piece like um, and I'm guessing that probably you took some classes on that, um, maybe even teach classes on that. But um, you know, you've talked about for those those two pieces that you've listened to your thought process and how you start. But how do you even think about notes? How do you even think about stringing those kinds of things together to create a work of music? Um, well, you know, um, a big part of my approach to composition is not much different than my approach to improvising as a jazz musician, uh, obviously, because. Uh, as so many know, improvising is essentially on the spot composition. I have no idea what I'm going to do next. Uh, and so I kind of have built up a, uh, a skill set to be able to kind of do things on the spot and improvise, which is composing again. Um, when, when I think about the idea of composing, obviously for classical musicians and classical composers, it is a little different than jazz. We kind of approach it from a different um, angle, um, somewhat similar, but but it has some, some different approaches. Um, but personally, as a jazz musician, um, and as a pianist, I usually always start with chords. And I have, I know more chords than I can probably, you know, even say in a lifetime. And so I usually, I just have a nice big catalog repertoire of chords in my head. Um, and I usually always start my compositions with harmony. And again, it's because I'm a pianist, but I know a lot of single note instruments like saxophones and trumpets, they usually start with melody. Um, and so I always start with harmony um, and usually the melody follows in some form, maybe it sneaks in while I'm playing or maybe it comes to me you know, in my head. And oftentimes I'll pull out my phone and I'll, I'll sing the melody in there and I'll go back later and figure out how it needs to go. But I know I want the melody to sound something like that. Um, but it, but that's kind of the process in which I begin to compose. And from there, things unfold. Let's add this instrument. Let's add this part. But everything usually stems from me being a pianist and starting with harmony uh, and then melody. And then everything kind of follows from there. Thank you. Um, I wasn't sure if it was a really basic question, but I, I'm just very, I'm not a very no. musically inclined person. So. <laughs> um, Rufus, how can we find you? Where can we listen to your music, either live or virtually? Um, what are you up to? <laughs> What's the future like? <laughs> um, you can find me on, obviously on social media and uh, Facebook. You can find me on Instagram, Rufus Ferguson Music. You can visit my website, RufusFerguson.com. Um, on there, you will see different interviews I have done. You will see different performances that I have 
performed, you also be able to see ways to contact me as well as um, my upcoming performing calendar. So I try to keep that up to date as possible. Um, and so you'll see me very often performing. Um, unfortunately, not a lot around West Michigan. I'm more of a Chicago, Detroit performer. Uh, but every so once, you know, once in a while, every so often, I do get a chance to perform uh, in Kalamazoo or Grand Rapids. Um, and so, yeah, you can visit my website for basically everything about me. Even from there, you can find me on different social networks. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I just lost my train of thought. I was going to yeah. say that... Um, <laughs> This is um, this art break today is um, celebrating the work of Rufus Ferguson, um, but also we want to draw your attention to the residence project in general. Um, so I know I mentioned, but if you're just joining us, you can go to the KIA, the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts, um, and go to the Unveiling American Genius exhibition. And when you're looking at certain works of art, um, there will be a label next to it and the label will have a QR code. Not all of them do. So the ones that have QR codes are the ones where, um, you know, Rufus and other musicians created a work of art, a uh, work of music to go with that, um, to go with that piece. And I'd really encourage you, um, even if you have been with us today and you've heard the music um, in this moment to come into the KIA and listen to the music in front of the work of art and, you know, does your experience with that work of art change now that you have heard from the musician um, or now that you are listening to it with a, with, um, with a musical composition. Um, so we are almost out of time. We're not quite out of time. So if Rufus has any final thoughts or if anyone in the comments has any final thoughts, um, we would love to hear them. Thanks, Bill. I, I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to, to seeing you around. And yeah, come out to some of my performances and say hello. It'd be good to see, to see you. And of course, thank you to everyone who participated today for your comments, commentary, questions. I, I appreciate it all. So thank you so very much. Um, and I will just say that we still have Elizabeth Start with us, um, the executive director of the Connecting Chords Music Festival, who also created some um, compositions. And um, she said to me that when she heard her music in the space um, with Hoku, a sculpture by Deborah Butterfield, that it changed um, or that it was very different for her. And I'm going to bring her back in if that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to point out that uh, when we were working on these, um, uh, the the festival board decided to include me as as uh, one of the one of the composers, and all we had to work with was just you know a little image that was sent to us, which was great. And of course, the uh, whatever we knew about that artwork, that artist, their artist statement, but. Um, you know, so I wrote these pieces looking at this little picture on a screen. And when I got to actually be there with, I hadn't even thought about how big the sculpture was, you know, and there it, it is, you know, like the size of a big dog. And, and it was just really neat to hear the music there uh, in that space with the actual um, artwork uh, present. And, and I mean, there's so much more you can see, of course, in, in person. So I recommend doing it uh, both ways. Visit the space and you know, you could even prep yourself by going to the website and, and seeing all the things. Um, but yeah, it's uh, really wonderful that this worked out so well. And um, I thank the KIA and everybody for helping this, helping this pull together. Rufus, have you gotten a chance to visit the KIA and um, see the piece with your music? I have, yep. It's, it's, it is definitely a completely different experience. Uh, like Betsy said, yeah, we, you know, we saw our our pieces, but they were very small compared to what's in the in the gallery. So yeah, it was uh, it was a surreal experience almost to kind of see that and and listen to it without being the composer. Well, I was the composer, but kind of just being able to stand around and listen uh, as a spectator kind of made me listen a little bit differently and even look at the piece a little bit differently. Yeah, well, and another great aspect is uh, obviously a lot of thought went into 
what pieces were where in the exhibit and and what you were what your work was adjacent to and mm -hmm. how how flowing through there um affected how that artwork looked to you so yeah. it's a wonderful exhibit definitely worth seeing Yes, everyone, please come and see Unveiling American Genius. Um, and I actually did want to mention that I know that some of us, um, many of us are staying home um, and there is a virtual version of the exhibition on the KIA's website. If you went to um, www.kiarts.org uh, and then you went to exhibitions current and future and there's an Unveiling American Genius button, I believe with Tylan Sawyer's work um, that we saw earlier. And um, there's an option to see the exhibition virtually, which of course we want everyone to do, but we also would love whenever you feel comfortable or whenever you're in the area to come and see the work in person. Um, and there is free Wi-Fi, so you can connect to the Wi-Fi so that you can listen to all of the music. Um, but it's about, about time, uh, we've had some really wonderful comments from the audience, some great questions, some great um, thoughts, and we're so appreciative to everybody for joining us today. We're very appreciative to Elizabeth for joining us to talk a bit about the project, and we're really, really grateful to Rufus Ferguson for joining us um, and giving us so much of his time today. So do either of you have any last thoughts before um, we say goodbye to everyone? Just want to say thank you to everyone for, for attending and participating and uh, indulging me as I speak about uh, this amazing artwork and my musical responses to them. And thank everybody for supporting music and art in our community. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for supporting music and art and all the arts in our community. Um, we're really lucky in our area to have so much access to arts. So, um, Everyone, this has been Art Break at Home with Rufus Ferguson and also with Elizabeth Start. And we're so happy that you have joined us um, either now or perhaps in the future as this is a virtual program, so it will be up. Um, and if you enjoyed it and you want someone else to get to experience Rufus's music, um, you can share it with a friend or a family member or a loved one and they can watch it later because it will be up. Um, and please do come in whenever you feel comfortable to the KIA and see the work in person with the music. Um, and thanks so much again to Rufus and Elizabeth. And we hope everyone has a really wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Bye. <laughs>